I don't know what kind of gerrymandering is going on to make the important states in the history of Star Trek be Montana and then Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's just getting to the uh, to the heart of America. You know, you don't want to have. I mean, if if they say, "Oh, the Vulcans touched down in in New York City," it's everyone's. You know, no one's going to believe that. Yeah, it's hard to. That's not where the real people live. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the real Americans can be found in Montana. I've never been to Montana. I've been to Pennsylvania, but not uh, not deep into the heart of Pennsylvania. I, d I don't know anything. I've about actually, Montana. we've been kind of uh, uh, <laughs> we've been thinking about places to go when you can go places again, and uh, I I don't know if it's because travel got so scarce, so I felt like I needed to to do something that I I, I wouldn't have thought to do, but my I. I was thinking I really want to go to South Dakota to see the uh, Mount Rushmore. Okay. Just because it's been in and the news or is there some deeper No, I know. I actually I had wanted to do that before it was a was a news item. Hmm. It was just one of those things where it's like that's an American landmark that I've never seen and probably will never see if I don't go out of my way to do it. Yeah. It's probably the least seen of the American monuments, you would think, right? Like people probably mm -hmm. go to Yosemite. Uh, quite frequently, and then you see everything in D.C. When you go to D.C., if you've ever been there, it's hard to not see everything that's there. Yeah, it's it's really kind of a weird landmark when you think about it because it's not finished, and it's also arguably shouldn't be there in the first place. Yeah, so. yeah, it's um, I'd like to see it too. I imagine it's one of those things everyone says it's smaller than you expect when you get there, but I'm sure it's mm. gigantic in and of itself. But yeah, um, they they uh, I saw some aerial pictures of it. It doesn't look great from the sky. Yeah. Because it's it's very clearly just shaved into the side a, of this yeah. beautiful mountain, and it just sticks out. And we had our own. Remember, the man of the mountain was the thing in New Hampshire. Oh yeah, that's remember, right. but then it yeah, fell off. His, <laughs> yeah, his face fell his off. Face fell off. <laughs> we we had a minor version of Mount Rushmore. I think Mount Rushmore's um, last. And ours was all natural, baby. Mount Rushmore's lasting legacy is to give you the phrase. Uh, the X, uh, the Mount Rushmore of X category. So, yes. like when you're determining yeah. what the best things are in a category, uh, you can go with the four, the four founding fathers mm -hmm. in this case. So, we're going to talk who, about who, are, who's on the Mount Rushmore of uh, retconned aliens who visited Earth before first <laughs> contact in Star Trek. <laughs> the Vulcans would certainly have to be the first chiseled uh facade onto that mountain i think maybe it'd be mm -hmm. by the time enterprise is over we'll have three more to add on to it but let's get into it <laughs> it's called carbon creek it's the next episode of star trek enterprise and we're going to break it down right after this if we remain here we'll die this world's on the brink of self-annihilation i don't believe that because your fascination with this species is blinding you you sit for hours each day in front of this idiotic device. I'm doing research. Perhaps if you spent more time observing human behavior, you might not have such a pessimistic view of them. Open your eyes. They revel in violence. They devote what little technology they have to devising ways of killing each other. So did we centuries ago. All right, everybody. So Carbon Creek is the second episode of the second season of Star Trek Enterprise. It aired on the 25th of September, 2002. Teleplay goes to Chris Black. I always get his name. I always say Chris Brack. Chris Black. Story credit goes to Rick Berman, Brandon Braga, and Dan O'Shannon. Directed by James Contner. In-universe date is April 12th, 2152. And then between October 1957 and January 1958. In this episode, T'Pol tells Archer and Tucker a story about her great... I think it's a, yeah, I guess it's her great grandmother and two other Vulcans who crash landed in a small Pennsylvania town in the year 1957. I don't know if you want to start this one, Clay, but here's a, here's a thought about this for you. Um, mm -hmm. I, while I was watching this, I said, this is clearly the best episode of Enterprise that they've done so far. When it was over, I don't know if I held that opinion anymore. But at, at, like while it was going on, I was like, "Oh, this is definitely this is definitely top tier Enterprise so far." It's it's only contender would be Dear Doctor, really, and I think that I think they're actually complementary ways of being good. I don't know if you think the episode is good, but I think Carbon Creek and Dear Doctor are two halves of a very good episode. That if we're stuck together, I know they're totally unrelated, but if you took the if you took the outlook and the sort of like style and the narrative choices that they make in each of them, I think you'd have almost a perfect Star Trek Enterprise. This one kind of splits them down the middle, and I think that for various reasons, that leaves both of them slightly 
less than perfect Star Trek episodes? Um, I, I don't know why they did this episode. Mm -hmm. I, it's, I ultimately, anything they were trying to do in it, the ending kind of undoes by being needlessly confusing. Sure. Uh, you mean in terms of the handbag that DePaul pulls out and looks at? Yeah. Okay. Is it supposed to be her great grandmother's or is it supposed to be hers? I think it's her great grandmother's. Yeah. It's like a hand me down. So it, I think the ending yeah. is just verifying that this actually happened. And T'Pol is not just being sort of crafty and telling them a story like she's hinting later on towards the sure. second I, to last uh, scene. I just don't understand. Like, this is. I, I don't know. It was. A, I feel like it's a story they've told a thousand times in Star Trek, and mm -hmm. I'm not really sure why they did it. Especially second second episode of your second season. I'm not totally sure why this is the decision. This is the way they decided to go. So the the reason that I think it's um the reason the the thing that I think that this one is lacking, which I think Dear Doctor has, is that ultimately I don't think that there's really enough of a conflict about the Vulcans <coughs> being on Earth uh, in this story. So, and I, I think that goes beyond to Paul's reaction to it and Archer and Tripp's reaction to it. I think that them being stuck on Earth is not nearly as um conflict ridden as it could be or like the the implications mm -hmm. of what this is isn't really stressed it's a it's a really small character story that is kind of unfortunately stuck with vulcans as the characters who have to be the focus of a story and the vulcans are mm -hmm. very hard to write that way they're hard to be the primary like drivers of things just because of their way that they're constructed so what you end up with is a an episode that feels like it should really be emotionally impactful, this one. Like they should all be stranded mm -hmm. there or something or there should be some sort of real coming to grips for these characters about what it means to be human or they have some kind of like impact on the timeline. Um, almost like a tragedy you'd kind of expect or some sort of like happy tragedy if you want to look at it that way. Mm -hmm. Like they end up happy, but it's kind of sad that they ended up that way. I think it kind of chickens out of all that stuff and it it doesn't, the reason that I like it as an Enterprise episode, and you can go off of this, is because it, you could say that this is very similar to um, City on the Edge of Forever, but I think it's mm -hmm. much more of an Enterprise story in that this is about how the form, this is the true first meeting of the Vulcans and humans. So it's Enterprise taking that time travel thing and kind of saying, actually, first contact with the Vulcans and the humans started much more before the series actually acknowledges that sure. it happened. Sure. And this is our time travel explaining <clears throat> that, which is only really thematically relevant to an enterprise series but once that's done i just don't think that there's enough of a tragedy here like the miners survive you know he doesn't get found out by saving the miners or anything like that so mm -hmm. everything that mm -hmm. feels like it could be a real troublesome problematic not problematic a troublesome um conflict ridden uh sequence of events turns out to be fairly laissez-faire in the long run yeah i uh, i i just don't know what you're really super gaining from say going back and saying oh it actually wasn't then it was a hundred years in the past before that and the reason the vulcans maintained contact or kept their eye on on uh, on the earth is because small town people in pennsylvania are really nice mm -hmm. i don't know i like i i yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. I think there's not a ton of... I mean, it's a fine story, I guess, but I just don't... This deep into into Star Trek series, I don't know why this is any different than any other time that the Enterprise has gone down to it. And I mean, maybe that's the point, is they're supposed to be playing it like it's a first... Like it's a uh, Prime Directive episode, but the humans are the aliens, but... I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I just, this one didn't land with me. Yeah. I, um, I guess I, I have to, I'll be the, uh, the positive uh, perspective, I suppose, on this one. I, I find this episode pretty charming. I find it to be, um, kind of, it, it works for me in a way that a lot of the sort of, um, Non Star Trek, great Star Trek episodes kind of work, and I think I don't know if I would put this up there with like City on the Edge or anything because I don't think it has that sort of central um, conceit that really connects you to what the material is, which is probably down mm -hmm. to the Vulcans again. But I, 
I I like when they occasionally same with the visitor and things when they when they st- when they put Star Trek into something else. I think that it really highlights <clears throat> like what it's supposed to be, and it almost refocuses the writers on what the Star Trek show is supposed to be. Because once mm-hmm. you're removed from the 22nd or 23rd or 24th centuries, and you put them back into a relatively modern timeline, um, what they are stands out to you. And I think that I I think here. One of the problems with this is that Enterprise's Vulcans are not clearly drawn as to what they're supposed to be. So we've complained about Soval in the past, and we've complained about the way that T'Pol acts when she met her hero, Valar, and we've complained about the way that the Vulcans seem overly emotional. I, I felt that there was room in this story. What this one's really missing is that the Vulcans, when they go back, are not to the point where they are currently in their Vulcan history where emotion has basically been suppressed. It's like a work in progress for them at this point. And so okay. the Vulcans are kind of enamored with Earth when they go here for the first time and they spend some some time there. And it causes a... I just see this as... If, if you're going to do something with the Vulcans where the Vulcans are emotional, this feels like a proper starting point for that kind of story where the experience of these three Vulcans has caused some kind of emotional groundswell or whatever, you know, they don't really get into that because the Vulcans are mostly just kind of observers of everything else that's going on in this Carbon Creek town, unfortunately. So Mm -hmm. again, for me, it really just comes back to there is no problem for the Vulcans. They like, they have to hide themselves, but their, their disguises are just wear hats over your ears, pull your hair over your ears and just kind of stand around. There's no, you know, to really make it like, Ultra dramatic. There's no. Um, it's not tied into like the history of. Well, Pennsylvania doesn't really seem like the right place, but like a history of lynchings or something. You know, when you find outsiders mm-hmm. in your small town America in the fifties, there's no mm-hmm. um, racial component. There's no real exploration of what it means to be an outsider in this world because they fit in well right. and then they just kind of get adopted into it. And I think that's really the big problem. But I, the charming atmosphere really gets me leading up to that. It's kind of unfortunate. There's nothing else to it. Yeah, it's like the the one element of of uh conflict that they do bring up is when Tapal's like they're only being nice to us because we look like white people. Yeah. And if we looked any different, they wouldn't and then they never even come close to broaching that. Like it's <laughs> I you know, every time I listen to a uh uh <clears throat> a podcast or or a story about serial killers, I'm always one of the things that always strikes me is how these just really nice everyday women end up married to active serial killers Mm -hmm. and how they never understood anything was was wrong. And now I see it based on this episode, the way that this woman is 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 dating this Vulcan who never takes his hat off (laughs) and talks like he's a robot. And she's just like totally enamored with him and thinks he's cute. Yeah. You know, like, I I don't know. It's yeah, they, they 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 like present the concept of a possible conflict but then they never do anything and yeah i i don't know I, it's well I, I the other way that you can take this right is that there's something they're doing something with to paul's great-grandmother here right she's she's mm-hmm. having some kind of reaction well, to- i'll tell you what they're doing is they're exploiting her body again is what they're doing <laughs> I, saw, I saw some definite nipple in that silhouette scene oh yeah yeah the- oh yeah yeah <laughs> it was a cold morning when and they do getting- it twice yeah. in the same scene yeah to paul's to paul's grandmother is th- this again comes down to the vulcans are tough to write this way to paul's grandmother is or great-grandmother is having some kind of conflict about what's going on she, she's either jealous of this other vulcan who's going off and like enjoying things or she's jealous of um, or she think that, thinks that there's some kind of danger to what's going on. It's never really clear what her great-grandmother's perspective is on this because the Vulcans don't talk about things like that. The Vulcans are just very much like, this is inappropriate for us to be doing. This is not part of the mission. You shouldn't be doing it. And he says, I think it is part of the mission. Like, I think there's no better way. While we're here, we might as well study them up close and things. So because the Vulcans aren't allowed to have a real conflict with each other, which I thought you could build into this if you're saying that over the course of the months that they've been there, they're slowly devolving and losing control of their sort of Vulcan outlook on life. Mm-hmm. I felt that there was room for that, but to Paul's grandmother, 
really honestly just feels like a way for T'Pol to be inserted into the story to know something. It's She doesn't have her own point of view or her own decision that she makes about what's going on. Even when they leave him at the end, um, it doesn't feel it doesn't feel super emotional or super interesting about why he's staying behind and why the others are choosing to go back. Why why they bother lying? Well, I know why they lie about it, but like even the lie doesn't seem that important. You know, they're like, yeah, we cremated mm-hmm. them and they can't come back or whatever. So vaporized. The, 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 the way the reason that I like it is just I think they do a a pretty good job of. It's a pretty good episode in terms of like feeling different, I guess. And I think it does thematically tie into Enterprise's sort of point of view about this is the founding and this is where it all began. I just wish it had slightly more to say about that. But what did you think about T'Pol's grandmother or the interplay between the uh, the Vulcans, the Vulcan trio? Um, I don't know. I thought her point of view was fairly clear as far as the uh, – <clears throat> she's the one who's sticking to the more rigid ideas of uh, – even though they don't say it, the prime directive idea of not involving yourself with the culture. Um, Cause she's, I mean, she's inter she's integrating herself, but she's making sure to do it from a distance. And I assumed that she was, but is she biased against the humans or is it purely a protocol thing? Because I'm not really interested in whether or not she's, a, uh, whether or not she's sticking to the protocol. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I didn't, I don't, I don't think she's biased against them. I mean, is she? Well, I mean, she does have that thing about, is it her or the other guy who says that they're on the brink of destroying themselves? Is it her? It's her, right? Uh, n- <clears throat> I n- they, have well, that they have the nuclear one bomb conversation scene. about theme. The guy, yeah. yeah, the guy who stays talks about the nuclear bomb. To, the, to me, the most anti-human Vulcan is the third guy, who's the plumber, who's constantly fixing things for other people. He, yeah, he seems the most yeah. anti-human and not wanting to stay there. But I... I think that you need to transplant his outlook onto T'Pol's great grandmother to make that interesting because T'Pol's great grandmother is interacting with the pro human Vulcan and their mm-hmm. their scenes don't really have enough there because she needs to be more antithetical to what he's talking about. And maybe she can learn something by the end of it and they all kind of learn something, but it just doesn't it's another it's a weakness well, of enterprise, they're not really learning stuff. Yeah, I think they in their three characters, they present three different points of view because you've got the pro-human Vulcan, you've got the, for lack of a better term, anti-human Vulcan, and then you've got the one who's essentially in the middle, who's just trying to follow protocol without getting emotionally involved. And taking that and coupling it with the fact that they're Vulcans, yeah, doesn't make it super engaging because if your focus is the one who's in the middle you're going to get the least amount of stuff out of her. Yeah. Um, but also, I think I don't think it would be... I think it would be kind of disingenuous for her to be, like, ragingly anti-human or something. Yeah. I don't know. Well, they haven't they haven't established what the Vulcans are to this point. We're just... We're still sure. confused about Vulcan culture and whether or not it's appropriate for them to get upset with other things or to be emotional. I didn't even realize... I didn't even realize the, the emotions and check thing wasn't something that existed at this point. I'm I'm going on what's been implicated, what the implication is of seeing so many emotional Vulcans. There's so many Vulcans that are being upset about stuff. It's it's the critique that I've had for like the season and a half or whatever we've been watching this. But oh, I see. Like okay. like Sovol, Sovol's performance. He's yelling and he's mad all the time, and no one right, no one's right. questioning that. So right, you know, here these guys actually feel more like the Vulcans I expect. Mm-hmm. But if they're doing something with the Vulcans, they needed more from them and sh- to show some kind of like. Uh, whether or not, like, if if the Vulcans going back and being exposed to emotional humans is a bad thing for them, you know, this it's a history that they mentioned in this episode. They're trying to escape from. They've mostly overcome at this point. We used to be violent. We used to have atomic bombs. We used to be a threat to ourselves. And if they're the osmosis of being in human culture, like, wears that away? You could see maybe why it would be dangerous for Vulcans to be on Earth or something. If you know, you got mm-hmm. these like super strong Zod type characters who are walking around. Um, but they don't, they don't do that either. So the the thing that I just, I really like the character of this one. I, I liked watching this and sort of being in this world with these guys. I agree with mm-hmm. you that there's not a lot there, but I'm also, I don't think I'm as negative on it as you sound to be. Yeah. I don't know. I just, it was, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't really honestly have a, a much to say about it, I guess, because yeah. it's, it's, it just, uh, yeah, I guess it was charming 
to an extent, but I didn't I didn't like the I didn't like the cutting back to the Enterprise, like she's literally telling them a story. Mm-hmm. It wasn't really working for me. And then at the end when she's like, Bah, I don't know, might have been true, might not have been true. That didn't I don't know. That it's Why do you think they did that? I honestly don't know. Um, Are you happy that they revealed the purse at the end, or would you have preferred it to I'm, be? Maybe yeah, it's a I'm a I'm a lot happier that they revealed the purse. Um, I think it's a pretty contrived ending, personally. Um, unless, <laughs> I, I okay. So if. If T'Pol holding on to this 200-year-old purse that her great-grandmother got from Earth is supposed to be is is supposed to be more than just proving that the story happened and is supposed to imply that um T'Pol has ingrained in her this some sort of respect for the humans which I assume is what they're going for because you know oh how come you've been able to be on the human ship longer than anybody else so I guess it's genetic or something mm-hmm. I I just find that to be f- kind of inconsistent with her character because she never really feels like like the whole if the whole point of her character is she's a Vulcan who's becoming starting to understand humans then does she really need like this secret backstory that her great grandmother actually lived among the human I don't know I just don't see what it's adding to her yeah I I actually don't even see it in terms of Maybe it's a negative. I, I don't actually see anything in terms of what it says about DePaul, really. Um, mm-hmm. I well, she she clearly like cherishes it. So yes, it has yeah. Otherwise, why would she be bringing a two hundred year old purse onto a starship <laughs> with her? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, aside from story reasons, you know. Yeah, she does. I mean, she she clearly cherishes it. She thinks that it's important. Mm-hmm. If it is some sort of indication as to why she's trying to give the humans a chance that is much more of a chance than any of her uh previous people the previous vulcans have given uh the humans i could see it working out there too to me it's um to me it just feels like an unnecessary twist at the end where they're like yeah who know who knows if this happens and they go oh it actually did happen because i um i don't know if she does it because she realizes that she's upset trip and maybe Archer to some level, or Chipper's like, this is not the history book. Like, why? why how the, how the mm-hmm. hell could this happen? You've totally un- upended everything. I don't know if she's then deciding to pull it back and say that, no, never mind. I was just, I'm drunk. I don't listen to anything I've been, t- I've been saying for the past two hours. I, I don't know. It, it's, another, it's another case of I, I frequently see Enterprise scenes, and I'm not exactly sure what the character is feeling. At that point, it's mm-hmm. the same with the uh, the last one at the end of Shockwave, where Archer's you put it over the top sequence. I, I think yeah. I I think I understand what is supposed to be going on in that scene, but it's not really clear because the characters don't say it, and it's not it's not clear in a sense that you're missing subtext. It's clear in a this is kind of a confusing dialogue that these two are having. I don't really understand why he can't just be open with her. Th- yeah, th- that, and that that's was also the end of this one. It's also kind of inconsistent for me. I think for us before they get to the pocketbook ending for her to be like well you know you asked me to tell you a story so i just made up something mm-hmm. that's that's not something that she does right you know so, that's not something uh, she, would seem to do yeah she went out of her way to fabricate quote unquote went out of her way to fabricate a entire alternate history of the first contact of vulcans yeah. and humans <laughs> just because she had like half a glass of wine yeah <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i i to me it to me, it felt like the ending was going to be, um, you know, she uh, she she goes to her quarters and instead of a purse, it feels like she would look at a photo of herself at the graves of those three Vulcans. You know, when she took her trip mm. to that to that place and she sees them or whatever, uh, it doesn't it doesn't do that. I, th- I think that's really kind of the the problem here. So if you were to I thought if you were to- I thought what they were driving at sorry I thought what they were driving at was she that her great grandmother actually stayed and that she was she had gone to visit her great grandmother who was still alive. Oh, I see. That's what who, I thought they were driving towards. Who, oh, but. and who gave her the pocketbook, or that just like that's one potential thing. That well, uh, bef- before they even got there, as they were getting to oh, she's telling the story. Why did she go there? I thought it was. I thought the the story she was telling was going to end with the grandmother great-grandmother staying on earth yeah and so 
whether or not you see to Paul tell them this, the point of her visit was to go visit her great grandmother who was who was on yeah, Earth or something. Still alive but, at that. Yeah, I mean, and um, do, is there? Am I missing something thematically, or is the only reason that to Paul's grandmother has to go back is because the script doesn't explain how she would have to Paul's mother? After that point, so like, are, are we to assume that mm. her her mother has already been born and is on Vulcan, and therefore that would have freed her up for the grandmother to stay, the great grandmother right, to stay there? I, yeah, that was where I was, uh, my head was at because they're talking about, oh, how old are you, and blah, you know. Yep. So I said, okay, so she could already have had a kid, yeah, and is now stuck on on Earth or whatever. Well, but or uh, but also. The how old are you thing also made me think that maybe it was supposed to be actually be to Paul, but um, oh, I see that wasn't the case. Yeah, obviously. that seems that seems. Um, I don't know if they've said how long Vulcans live or if this episode's playing with it. It's, it doesn't really matter. But is there mm-hmm. a um, what's what was served by having to Paul's grandmother go back? I guess because the the only reason I thought she had to go back was because the writer was like, well, she has to go back to have a family that continues on this story. But mm-hmm. I think you can easily right around that through the Vulcan age discussion. Yeah. Yeah. I just, absolutely. I don't, I don't know what's gained by not having all of the Vulcans stranded on earth. I just, th- I think that makes more sense to me than one yeah. of them stays behind and you never see him again. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a couple things probably. I think it's sort of the implication of what trip says to try and cut. Cause they know as they're writing it, how that this is a problem. Um, because they have trips say that thing where they're like, well, how, how come you, you, this guy just existed on earth and then he died and the, the undertaker never noticed he had pointy ears. You tell me no one ever saw his pointy ears. Some, some bitch didn't knock his head off. Everybody on screen like turns to camera and goes, (laughs) I I was expecting Um, a scene where they take like a Vulcan lays his head on the ax chopping block and they just chop their ears off, you know, like like, fit in. And I'm going to one of. Earth's larger cities to have something called plastic surgery done. <laughs> They've got um, those cutting tools that dug him out of the mine. Just point a little bit at ten percent on his ears I know, and yeah, melt just, him off. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a continuity thing, much like the Ferengi appearance, where it's like, all right, in order for this story to to make any sort of sense or be meaningful at all, one of them has to stay behind. But if we leave two or possibly three Vulcans on earth for 200 years. That's a little bit of a stretch. We need to, we need to, we need to, I I, 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 I don't buy the Ferengi thing. I mean, I I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. I don't have a problem with it, but I'm, I feel like this is the conversation that's being had as they're writing it because again, they have trips say that line. So they're, they, they're acknowledging the fact that there's a problem as far as as this stuff goes. Um, excuse me. But I, uh, yeah, I don't. I sending her back. Like I said, the I I feel like the only way I really get something out of this is if the po- the th- end of this story is this story is supposed to be a uh, indication of of why the Vulcans felt like the the humans are worth, were worth waiting around keeping for. their eye on, yeah. and that only really works if T'Pol can go back and re- or sorry. Tamir, is that her name? Yeah, Tamir. Tamir can go back and report on what happened, I guess. But they don't show those scenes. Just- Isn't that, that like that's a? I I agree with you, and I think that's what they're saying is that this is kind mm-hmm. of a what this did. I don't think they mentioned this at all, but what this did was this gave the Vulcans reasons to wait around for the humans to catch up with them. And so, if you don't if you don't have a scene that really calls that out, her going back doesn't make a lot of sense. But her going back in that context. Does you do understand why you need a Vulcan to go back in that case? Um, yeah, like if they had, I don't know, if they had set it up so the because the 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 initial scanning and observation of Earth is just because they launched Sputnik into into space, mm-hmm, right? Yeah. So if they had set it up as though they weren't just checking them out because they shot something into space, but that. Given the time, honestly, what they should have done is they they should have set this like ten years later, during like the Cuban Missile Crisis or something. Yeah. So you've got Earth that's potentially it's in the middle of the Cold War. It's on the brink of destruction, and so the Vulcans are now at the point of we've been we've been watching these people for since they launched Sputnik. So we've been watching them for ten years, 
it seems like they're just going to destroy themselves. We're about to write Earth off. Then they end up crash land, landed on this, uh, you know, in the middle of Americana and learn why kind white American people are the saviors of the entire galaxy, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so, you know what I mean? So there's some sort of shift, some sort of tonal shift instead of, eh, we're just kind of checking them out. We crash landed. We kind of checked them out. They're actually not so bad as, as we thought. Yeah. And then they go back and essentially nothing changes. But to ha I wish there was some something there as far as Tamir really getting something out of this experience instead of instead of just inventing Velcro. Mm -hmm. Which and being and like her her opinion of the humans have changed because one kid, smart kid didn't get into college. Yeah. You know, I I just I, there's I just wish they were doing more with the story other than, yeah, my 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 aunt spent six months in Pennsylvania and then now she all she does is talk about Pennsylvania. Yeah. I where do I want to go with that? I mean I I think that the I, I think And the, why sorry, why did they pick Pennsylvania? Why like if if the I'm sorry. I keep. I'm sorry. I keep harping on 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 the race thing, but I feel like they should have landed in a place that was a little bit more multicultural mm -hmm. or something. Why? So they could, because I feel like that's part of the part of the future of this franchise is it's uh, at least perceived um, everybody's equal unity kind of thing, mm -hmm. and getting that sort of. Uh, well, I guess maybe the '60s isn't the best time to land then. This is the fifties, um, so they're, they're, yeah, I know. But I'm thinking like if they were, if they did jump ten years into the future, yeah. I mean the fifties is probably even worse. But yeah, <laughs> um, but you know, but like some sort of larger worldview thing. I don't know. It's just it's just an odd choice for me. Yeah, I don't. I mean, is there a uh, is there a minority in? I mean, it's a different time of production, but there's no there's no minorities in City on the Edge, right? Are there? I can't remember any. Maybe there are. The um, in the, 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 like the soup kitchen, along with everybody else. I don't else. remember. Yeah, pro I mean, honest, it's probably all the the homeless people are probably that's in, minorities that's in Chicago given, or something. I forget where they given land the and, time that it was made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I. But he, but to be but but to be fair, that's not the point of that story. Right, but uh, I, I would say the Vulcans here are supposed to be the outsiders there. I just I don't sure. know what like if the Vulcan met a met a uh, like a black person, for instance, in this episode. I don't know. The Vulcans would almost ignore that, right? Like the the Vulcans right. would consider that to be largely irrelevant at this point. So I think you have to make the Vulcans the other in this if you're going to do anything with it. And but then, they don't. No, though. they don't. They, 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 they choose. They to do don't. That. Right. And that's and that's part of why I wish that there was that representation. I think because they do talk about this idea that well, if we didn't look exactly like them, they might be a lot worse to us. You've got no qualification for that statement because either she's it's like a Schrodinger's cat of racism, essentially, mm -hmm. where it's like as as soon you you don't see it so they could either be a super racist and they just don't show it because they look normal or they could be totally accepting but you don't see it because they just look normal well that's the so it, yeah sorry go ahead if you're no it's just it's just like again it's like why why bring that up and then not do anything with it but also set it's just and also set your story in a in a situation where th none of these things that are being tossed around as as far as concerns are are ever broached well that's the so i, th I think there's a solution here and apologies for everyone who hates it if you rewrite the episodes but uh, generally the reason that i sort of quote unquote rewrite these episodes is that i think it highlights like where i think the problem lies fundamentally mm -hmm. and while i like this episode i think that the the thing you were just making fun of which is to put a kid through college makes a lot more sense if that kid is the diamond in the rough that the Vulcans find in this town. So the town itself has more reflective values of 1950s America than relatively modern views of, oh, they're all good people in this town. Everyone's very mm -hmm. pleasant to them, and everyone's very everyone's very like, oh, I'll help you get to, uh, I'll take you to the gas station. They go, fuck you. And he's like, yeah. all right, see you later, and let me know if you need any help. <laughs> but if, the, if this one kid, right, 
was the sort of future looking Gene Roddenberry looking at the stars, hoping for a better future. And he's like, if only I could go to college and I want to become, you know, I want to break free of this small town America mindset and I want to sort yeah. of like expand. That would thematically match the Vulcans viewing the humans as primitive, right? And and Tamir would see this mm-hmm. kid as, oh, these these this species is capable of something. They are here. Is it appropriate for us Vulcans to interfere to spark that growth? If, if even a small mm-hmm. act like T- Tamir sending this kid to college through inventing Velcro, is that a conflict that the Vulcans would have because they think that they should not interfere whatsoever and that that's outside the the lines of what's acceptable? But she chooses yeah. to. And she sparks something, and they have a very small, very minor impact on Earth. You don't even know what this kid does eventually, but that. Well, I would, I, I would argue that whatever the kid does is is way less impactful than inventing Velcro, right? <laughs> because that's that's <laughs> kind of a big deal. I mean, I like it, how the the guy immediately saw the the things you could do with Velcro. I was I was yeah. watching that going like, if someone gave me that, I'd be like, what the fuck is this? Like, what am I supposed to do with Velcro? I see no use for this whatsoever. That guy immediately knows that this is a billion dollar industry he's got at his fingertips. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not it's it's not uh, inventing transparent aluminum or whatever it is in Star Trek Four because that's not something that we have any frame of reference for. Right. Yeah, but the creation of Velcro is a huge deal. Mm-hmm. As far as I think, I think it's actually I mean, an appropriate thing anything. to invent in Star Trek. I thought it was small enough that it actually makes mm-hmm. sense that the Vulcans would give that to, or that they it could be an alien technology when no one would think about it. You know what I mean? Sure. No. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it makes sense. I think it's a really clever choice. But I, it's it's just uh, the character who is like, we can't. How dare you want to live among them? You, we can't impact their timeline. Yep. But then she hands them Velcro, which is like a, a literally world changing invention. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that would that would have been my fix. I think that it's just the, yeah. the episode is missing that what the Vulcans are conflicted about and what the culture of humanity is at that point. Like, and if you're the the fifties are an interesting time to choose. Because if you if you're thinking about the '50s, that's kind of what your mindset would be: is that it's like it's mm-hmm. pre the turnover into the civil rights era and everything. It's like the last gasp yeah. of the Mad Men era, and they don't really comment on that, other than it seems like a nice place to take a vacation for a couple months because it's relatively yeah. low key. That's that's the other thing too: is it's just like it's such a Norman Rockwell painting version of the '50s, mm-hmm. and. I just, I don't know. I just find that tough to swallow, especially coming off of Deep Space Nine with like the Benny Russell episode and stuff. It's like, it's it's really difficult for me to go from that into uh, they land in the postcard perfect version of the 50s and it turns the Vulcans into thinking that they're actually, pre- the, the humans are actually great and worthy of ex- further expl. I don't know. Yeah. It's just, it feels really... Uh, I don't want to do this. Um, if I, I don't, I, I'm not going to say that it is reactionary to the time that it was made, but it does have an air of American exceptionalism to it. Yeah. Uh, that may or may not have been influenced by the point in history in which it was created. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's looking, I'm I'm torn because I think we're we're now in like a political climate where if you look at the 50s, if you're not saying it's the worst, most racist era of human history, I'd, like it's it's almost mm-hmm. like factually incorrect to do anything other than just hammer home that there were problems in the 50s yeah. uh, that have since improved. It's so the, the reason that I I'm would not add, saying I'm not saying they need to land there and then all of a sudden everyone's yelling the N word at people. No, but anything, I just but I don't like, see what else they can really do at this point because yeah. the the whole thing is that they are aliens in this world. So that seems mm-hmm. like it's really just drawn to they are being seen as the other. And I I just can't think of any other thing that would be satisfying to be a conflict that the Vulcans would run into. Like I wouldn't be interested if Vulcans, you know, like a Vulcan a human got his hand on that uh Vulcan mining drill thing. You know, mm-hmm. and somehow in the Vulcans, like, we have to get it back from them. And they go in wacky hijinks. Yeah. I don't want to see yeah. that. The The episode no. feels like it's meant to be more emotional and more impactful than that. Sure. So I think that, yeah, that that's really the only, it's not that that's the only thing that you can do, but it's the only thing that I think makes sort of a relevant sense in terms of what the episode is doing as a timeline that they're choosing to jump Oh, into. totally. Yeah. And they, they just don't do it. Like, it, it's shocking to me that they don't have uh, the the woman at the bar find out that, 
that main guy there has pointy ears. Mm-hmm. It's That's a kind like, of a strange subplot. To, I don't really. It's just to show that he's growing closer to humans, I suppose, for whatever that amounts. Yeah, to. Yeah, but it just seems like such a a, a lob ball over the plate mm. to to have one person find out and then like be cool with it or whatever. I don't know. It's just it's just a weird thing for them to go out of their way to to talk about and then never address it in the story itself. Yeah. Yeah. Cuz if cuz I think you're right. I think they are try they're presenting the Vulcans as this other who are trying to understand they're trying to survive but with but without impacting the humans too much, but they're also trying to keep their distance as if, if for like scientific reasons. And all of those things are fine, but if they all work perfectly, then you don't really have a story. Right. Yeah. And I, um, I'd argue they're there too. The episode, I think, is very clear that they're there to see the spark of humanity. It's just that to me, sure. it's not a spark. The whole field is on fire because there's nothing else other right. than like positivity that they're running into. So it's strange right. they, they, they would even have a, um, a bias against them in the first place. Uh, yeah, and there's not even 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 let's say even if they don't, no one finds out that they're Vulcans or aliens or whatever. They don't. There's no conflict within the people of the town that they witness and see it like resolved or right. something. You know what I mean? Yep. Like that's another way you could go, where some sort of conflict happens and then Tamir's like, "Up oh, here we go. This is this is exactly this why, is why we they're going to blow involved. themselves up. This is where the bomb is yeah. going to come and cleanse this whole." And then place. they have some sort of peaceful resolution to it, which is surprising to the Vulcans. And you know, I like anything, literally anything. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, no. I, I. I agree. I. I think that. You c- I thought I was kind of hoping that it was going to turn into like a Vulcan version of uh, 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 the color of money mm-hmm. and. <laughs> The main guy was going to go start pool hustling in order to get money for that kid to go to college. Yep. That would that, I would watch that story. Yeah. <laughs> Paul Newman shows up to trot around this Vulcan who seems like he's on the spectrum to everybody else on Earth, but he's really good at playing pool. Come on, that writes itself. <laughs> the Vulcans are the initial autism disorder. It's like some doctor, the yeah. town doctor is like, what's wrong with these guys? It's like Kingpin, only instead of an Amish person, you have a Vulcan who's really good at pool. You mentioned the, a similarity to Far Beyond the Stars, which is the Benny Russell DS9 episode. I think that they are similar, but they are different enough where I think that the theme of each series should take over. So the, the DS9 mm-hmm. one is kind of about, uh, it relates thematically because it's about the oppression of the Dominion and that there's oppression in Earth's past. And Cisco, as a black man mm-hmm. is kind of able to move between those two worlds where his race doesn't matter in the 24th century, but it's like the primary thing in the 1950s world that he right. runs into. Enterprise, Enterprise is all about the founding and sort of getting through mm, slight misunderstandings or prejudices that the races like the Andorians and the Tellarites and the humans and the Vulcans all have towards each other. They haven't done a very good job of effectively showing that because we've had very right. limited interaction with those races. But Enterprise, to match the theme of how DS9 matches theme to that DS9 episode, it should have just been about finding common ground in something that doesn't seem very common groundy at the point, at that point, because you're also different from each other. And I just, I don't mm-hmm. think they hit that hard enough to make it a perfect episode. No, because there's, there's no common ground to be found. Or it's all common ground, uh, I think. Yeah. Or, yeah, I get, yeah, I guess that, yeah. The Vulcans are just but, yeah, enamored with them. You know, it's, it's, right. There, there's no, in order, in order to see common ground, there has to be something that is not common ground, which you occasionally, you know, you see in the Andorites, the Andorians and the Vulcans, because the Andorians are so fiery and emotional that the Vulcans just can't get along with them. Here, mm-hmm. I think you're supposed to see the chaos that the Vulcans keep telling us that humanity represents. Like all these scenes in Enterprise of the Vulcans going like, you guys are babies. You don't know what you're doing out here. Like all your decisions are just horrible because you're overly emotional. But if they see some some little glimmer of hope to build a relationship with. I think then it's all worth it in terms of this episode. But all they see here is, well, humans are actually quite pleasant to be around. There's really no downside to humans whatsoever. Hope they don't blow each other up with a bomb. I'll see you next time in 20 years or whatever. Yeah, at least they didn't at least they didn't uh, say that they landed in the 21st century and then all that Velcro money just goes <laughs> towards uh, Jake's opioid addiction. <laughs> well, call- uh, you know, I also... I- uh, this is probably really unfair to say, and I, it's not a criticism. It's just a uh, something I've noticed. 
I don't know if um, Jolene Blaylock's performance is just inherently like lusty or something, but every single person who has a scene with her, it seems like they all want to have sex with her. Mm -hmm. Like the the scenes with Trip and Archer, I'm like, this feels like two clicks away from a porno breaking out. <laughs> have some more with, wine. And it's not and it's not really her. It's like the other people in the scene. Yeah. She's just doing her thing. And but like Archer and Trip talking to her, they're like, Yeah, so so you're telling me that uh well, it's her, you had no other reason for going <laughs> it's there? Her, yeah? It's her there's no there's no way for other characters to play against DePaul except that they are the ones probing her, right? Maybe that's an unfortunate yeah. term of spin of words, but <laughs> as much as they want to probe her, you know that because T'Pol is by nature as a Vulcan not going to be the one giving out information. Other right. characters yeah. have to force themselves on her to make her say something. So it, it, also it, questionable it, choice. That was a little bit more intentional, but it, so it comes. Yeah. It comes across as a little bit in Archer and Trip's terms. It comes across like those uncomfortable things of a girl who's not interested meeting right. two slightly yeah. aggressive guys who are not. I'm not going to say that they. I'm not saying this. The scenes drip with this like sexual violence that's about to happen, but it feels like they have to be, they have to be the aggressor in the conversation yeah. with her, and it comes across. And I, way. I, I never, I didn't really feel this towards the beginning of the series, so I don't know if it's a. We mentioned it in change. Broken Bow. It, it, it's definitely oh, noticeable okay. because when Archer gets angry with her, there was that scene in the beginning. It's like it feels like this. Like a rape is about to happen. Like when Archer and Trip are yeah. yelling at her, it feels very uncomfortable in some ways. Yeah, and it's not. And I I don't think I think you're right. It's not her. It's I think it's the people who are in scenes with her or the way the writing's working. Because the same thing happens with that kid in Pennsylvania. Because the whole time I'm like, so he's just he's just trying to sleep with her, right? Mm -hmm. Like they I, they're having this conversation about the stars and whatnot. But I'm like, he's. I feel like he's trying to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, rightfully so. She's beautiful. But yeah. it, it, it's uh, I I at the, as soon as those conversations start, I was like, kid, you're you're punching way above your 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 weight here. He's like, I'm just um, I'm just doing this to pay my way through college to Paul to me. Earth is there's, there's nothing. There's, this is not what I want yeah. to be doing. It's just the way. No, but uh, it's it's just an odd thing that yeah, I think you're right. I think it's uh, any Spock doesn't have that problem as male. The the maleness no. seems like a cool i'm in control of the situation thing where the female yeah. character having that feels um defensive in some ways or at least that's how that's how it hits me in sort of the way that and i, I think it's also i think it's also uh bacula and the guy who plays trip mm -hmm. connor trenier yeah are have like can't seem to shut that sort of like shrugged eyebrows flirtiness thing yep. off yep. no matter who they're talking to yep so when it when they're talking to to Paul, it seems that much more amplified because she is so closed off. Yeah. yeah. What do you think of her performance in this? Is to Paul is Jolene Blaylock a good actress in this role? Uh, in this role, yeah. Is it hard I think to she is, is. Do you think that to Paul and Tamir's characterization hides something, or do you think that I see a lot of I see a lot of reviews about this episode saying that this is where her weakness as an actress comes out because. She cannot effectively portray Tamir any differently. I honestly don't know where I stand because my conception of the Vulcans is that they all kind of act this way. So I think that it's appropriate right. for her to be this way. I don't think that's, yeah, I don't think that's her fault. I just, I don't think that they, <laughs> they didn't really effectively make her a different character. No, she, she, <laughs> she, she, <laughs> when it starts, you're like, oh, she, to, to Paul is just in the, I don't know if they call her Tamir enough immediately. Yeah. When the ship yeah. is crashing, every time they cut to her, the other Vulcan should be like, Tamir, Tamir, not to, Tamir, Tamir, over here, Tamir, yeah. Tamir. I need like visually she looks exactly the same yeah. exactly the same haircut and everything yeah. uh, i mean i guess all the vulcans have that same that's that's another same reason why i thought they were going to land when you're behind a sheet yeah. looks good yeah <laughs> that's uh, that's another reason i thought they were going to land in the 60s cuz i was like man they're teeing up a beatles joke i know yeah. they are yeah but they they three managed stooges. to not do that three they did yeah they went with three stooges instead um yeah i don't think they they effectively uh, i and i think that's part of it where it's like Tamir's characterization is essentially identical to, to Paul's characterization, where she's there to observe, but she ends up being uh, reluctantly affected by the actions of the humans around her. That's exactly what to Paul is. Yeah. Um, and she she helps them out or shows her shows her growing affection 
while maintaining distance. That's exactly what T'Pol does. Yep. So there's no there's no different it, no difference in the way that those characters are portrayed. So I think yeah, I think criticizing her I, it's tough to criticize her acting because she's doing the same thing she does in every episode. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I and find she's it not hard. giving she's not given a lot to react to, to. You know, she's she gets a little bit heated with the other Vulcan guy, but even there, it's just yeah, uh, yeah. She's not really given a lot to work with. No, I, I I don't I don't think it's an easy role that she's kind of stuck with. And no, no, no. Um, I don't think this is enough evidence to say that she's doing a bad job, really, or that it's a, a kind of a limitation because the Vulcans are all kind of similar in that way. Um. And to portray her differently requires a script that treats that character, Tamir, differently. And the script doesn't mm-hmm. treat that script any differently. Or the script doesn't right. treat the character any differently. So, Which is also why I found it confusing at the end. Because I thought, like, so wait, is the implication that that was actually just to Paul the right. whole time and she just changed the name? I didn't even think so, about that. Um, yeah. I don't think that's possible based on what we know. Uh, no. I think, so what I would have done differently at the end. I wouldn't do the purse thing because I think the purse thing is a little bit silly and on the nose. I would have had her finish her story. If you're going to do the thing where she's like, I don't know, maybe I was just joshing you guys. See ya. If you're going to do that thing, have the last scene be the close of the story. So you get to see what happens after T'Pol stopped telling the story. So you, you get to see Tamir going back and making some sort of, you know what I mean? Making some sort of decision about what she just saw. Something that uh, implies... I would, have showed, I would have showed the Vulcan who stayed behind arriving in New York on a bus or something. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Exactly. Like something to imply that what we just watched has any sort of impact on, on anything. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'd agree. I, I, don't, I don't like the ending. Uh, I just think it's needlessly kind of confusing and doesn't add anything to what they think that they're talking about i, I just would have liked yeah. to have seen those characters uh, or like just uh, even or the vulcan a, going back to vulcan or whatever yeah it's another it's another uh instance of mystery for the sake yeah. of mystery and, and not serving a pl- the plot or anything let's take a break we'll play a clip from the episode we'll come back read some patron thoughts and give our final thoughts about carbon creek how long did this mistral stay on earth the rest of his life presumably and that would be what another 100 150 years possibly longer <laughs> an alien is left on earth in the 1950s lives through what 30 presidents travels the world and no one notices him and what happened when he finally kicked the bucket did the undertaker just shrug and ignore his ears you asked me to tell you a story <laughs> it was a good one but did it really happen? As I said, you asked me to tell you a story. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you enjoyed the show, you can support us at patreon.com slash the Penske file, patreon.com slash the Penske file. A couple dollars a month gets you extra podcasts, casts, extra podcasts, extra videos, uh, behind the scenes stuff. There's polls that you can uh, fill out or vote on uh, to determine what we talk about. And as always, our Captain Tier supporters get a special thank you. Special thanks go to Christian Pouch, Tark Latif, Chris Tinsley, Mike Burnett, Cardinal Doomsday, Joint Mango, Ben Douglas, Neil Brennan, Cal Barrett, Nick Samuel Custer, Matt Ross, Nathan Elliott, Eric Johnson, Andrew Cholog, Grim Santo, Matt Cutler, Dwayne Hackett, Sean, Jordan Cooper, Kevin Reyes, Vault 13 Hero, Stephen Minton, David Beardmore, Darth Mosk, HH28, Matt Curry 6, Jacob123, Matt Houston, Point Extra G, Nick Sergi, Jakey's Gamer, Patrick Seba, Captain Brazen, Kevin Lowry, Eric's Antoine, Bradley Killens, Corey Martin, Woodrow, Rune Vendler, Vin- uh, William Scheisler, and Timothy Cooley. Thank you very much, guys, for supporting the show. Much appreciated. And now we're on a bit of a time crunch, so we'll read these patron comments. If you're a patron, you can leave your thoughts about upcoming episodes, and we'll read them on the show and react to them. Where's the first one? There it is. Matt Ross says, Carbon Creek, arguably the best episode out of the entire series run. Is this a story, or did it actually happen? Nice that the actual inventor of Velcro, Mestral, is named here as well. To Paul's holding onto 400-year-old handbag was a sweet memento moment, as well as references to I Love Lucy, a.k.a. Desilu, and the semi-callbacks to City on the Edge of Forever. Quibbles aside, I think this story is a sweet, hopeful vision that is clear to this version of Star Trek with a brief view of ourselves. Wait, did they pick Pennsylvania because it was in trains, believable trains ride distance from the guy who invented Velcro? I don't know. I, the guy's, <laughs> I guess the Vulcan's name is the same as the guy who invented Velcro, Velcro I guess. 
I didn't know that. I'm not fluent in the history of Velcro, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, Lazio Librarian says, Carbon Creek, a nice episode with a simple story. However, they noticeably glossed over race and gender issues of the time to present a very idealized picture of the past. Having visited West Virginia, I find myself doubting small mining towns would be so welcoming to strange newcomers with suspicious backstories. Sorry, not sorry, West Virginia. Three antique purses out of five. Point Extra G says, reminiscent of Voyager's 1159, where Kate Mulgrew played one of Janeway's ancestors. This episode succeeds where 1159 failed by actually tying the story into Star Trek lore. The Vulcan's interest in Earth is to why, uh, is why they were in the vicinity for first contact, showing Tamir slowing, slowly, slowly going from hostile to selling Velcro for Jack's educational education echoes to Paul's own journey on the show so far. And it's always nice to see period costumes, location shooting, and a very different musical score. Kyle Barrett says, an episode where, a predict- where the predictable and light plot is completely surpassed by how delightfully charming it is. It, of course, harkens back to classic Trek of old, but never basks in nostalgia for too long. It's still an Enterprise episode through and through, with the focus on early Vulcan and human relations and some gratuitous, gratuitous shadow nudity. It's a shame it ends on a slightly weak image because I hadn't even noticed the purse beforehand, although a photograph would have been too tropey, but it's a five out of five nonetheless. Question, should the episode wow. have been shot in black and white? Would have made the I love uh, Lucy thing fitting. Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't think. I don't think it was uh, necessary. No, I don't think it would add anything. Uh, Eric Antoine says, arguably the first great episode of the series. It's so good, in fact, you almost wish it were the backdoor pilot for a series, which would be so much better than the series you're actually watching. Go along with me. The weekly adventures of displaced Vulcans in the 1960s Pennsylvania mining town, and every once in a while, to Paul's grandmother or whatever, invents something new. Just wait until she comes up with a beer cozy. Now that's a Star Trek prequel I can really get behind. And as for the kick-ass theme song, anything from the Joshua Tree, or better yet, Peter Gabriel's Don't Give Up Appointment Television, that is... Yeah, it sounds like a great show. A bunch of <laughs> outsiders who are never exposed as being outsiders, just living in small town Pennsylvania, doing nothing. It's a sitcom. Can't wait. It's a sitcom. You build it around that. Benjamin Espinoza, final comment says Velcro. What a fun little character study episode. This was a prime directive story in reverse. I wish. Sorry, I wish they had done because I would I would have hated it. But I wish they had done when she goes and, and invents the Velcro, give him the Velcro. I wish I wish she had the guy had been like, "What do you call this thing?" And she was like, "Vault, <clears throat> Velcro, Velcro, Velcro." <laughs> like looks over at the stuffed crow in his desk. Velcro, oh, ben- Velcro, Benjamin Espinoza, Velcro, Vol- Velcro. What a fun little character study episode! This was a prime directive story in reverse with the humans as the alien species. I love that Mistral stayed on Earth as an explorer, and I feel like a logical explanation could have been given rather than claiming he died. Is it possible he's still alive on Earth? Do the math. Four to Paul's grandmothers out of five. Very positive reaction from the patrons, Clay, which means you're wrong about your opinion. Um, Mm. But thank you, patrons, for leaving your thoughts about that one. Um, I think everyone pretty much had points that we uh, had mentioned previous to that. It's... um, my my sort of final rating of it is I do think it's charming, I do think it's missing the dear. Th- to to bookend what I said at the start, dear doctor to me has a central conflict that is interesting enough to be the entire episode, where I I, I think that dear doctor's central conflict is kind of wrapped up in a rather um, stereotypical or trope episode outside of that. So uh, mm. while I like everything that's going on, there's nothing that's really interestingly new or different or. Um, remarkable about the way that Dear Doctor works. It's just perfectly functional in first season of Enterprise. Here, it's got that unique setup that you think is going to be really memorable and amount to something, and it just doesn't have the Dear Doctor problem stuffed inside of it. So I would have liked to have combined those two things, and at that point, I think you have a tremendously memorable episode. Yeah, my my problem with it is um, kind of similar to, to what you're saying, where I don't feel like... Um, <clears throat> they're making a point with anything that they're saying. Like, it, I feel like T'Pol telling this story should have some weight to it as far as like being representative of what the Vulcans as found so redeeming or like you're saying, the spark that they, that they found among the humans. And I just, it's just, it, it it's just a, it's just a two month vacation in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. There's, there's nothing, it's like, 
It's like if you, it's like if you're, uh, when you're, when a, your college friend does a semester abroad in, in England and then comes back and starts saying like Lou and Lori all the time. <laughs> like it's like, it doesn't mean anything. There's the, they, they just were like, they had a nice time in Pennsylvania Dutch country and all of a sudden that they want to help them invent warp drive or whatever. I don't know. It's, I don't, I, I feel like if you're going to tell this story, it needs to be a little bit clear as to why and what you're taking out of it other than these humans seem nice. Yeah. So it doesn't really work for me. I'm going to give it a four. I think it's, I think it's second to Dear Doctor in terms of the, the best Enterprise episodes that we've seen so far. But I do think it's lacking something that really makes it a classic episode. But I would, I would say that someone should watch this one um, if they're unfamiliar with the series. I think, it's, I think it's good enough for that. Yeah. You don't have to give it a four. You sounded more negative on it than that. No, I'm not going to give it a four. Um, I feel like charm only gets you so far, mm-hmm. and I think I'm going to give this one a two. Wow, the subtext to that comment, I can feel it. Um, yeah, subtext lacking from the episode sorry, what did, I, I think my brain just misfired. What did you give it? Two. Oh, two. Oh, wow. Okay, good. That's our biggest discrepancy so far, I think. Two two numbers is a big difference for us. Um He'll give it. To, Clay gives it a two. I give it a four. Visitor esque response to that one. Um, let's see here. I guess that's it. Thank you very much for listening, guys. patreoncom slash file if you want to support the show. Otherwise, all the links are down below at thepenskyfile.com slash links link. You can click that. Uh, I guess that's pretty much it. Clay, what do you uh, what do you have coming out here? Do you want to say anything? Um, got a new. We had a new episode of Rotten Horror Picture Show come out. We did uh, our. Third wild card pick, which is Return of the Living Dead, one of my favorite zombie movies. And uh, next week, I believe we finally actually have Bullet for Bullock and Trial coming out. I've been nice. wrong every time I say it. I'm going to say that probably every every week <laughs> now, from <laughs> even after it actually comes out. All that matters is the shot. Uh, that for you badass, made. that is. Yep, badass will be on there, and uh, badass is on Wednesdays, and Rotten Horror is on Tuesdays, alternating. You can go to thepenskyfile.com to get those shows. Otherwise, the Penske Podcast.com is where you can find all the Star Trek shows and YouTube and all that stuff. I think that's it. Guys, thank you very much for leaving your comments about Carbon Creek. Thank you, patrons, for supporting the show. I just, I just realized I'm wrong. It's not those two episodes. <laughs> we're not going to correct it. It's, we're going <laughs> to... Yeah. I believe, it's, I believe it's Sideshow and the Worry Men. Final call. Final answer. Uh, give me two seconds. It is <clears throat> do, 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 uh, the do, episodes do. we are doing this week are. Do, do, uh, do. Do, 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 do. Shit, where the hell is do, it? Do, do, do. They're gone. Wait. Worry Men and Sideshow. There you go. There we go. Worry okay. Men and Sideshow. You guys can look forward to that on Badass. And otherwise, all the other stuff is out there. Thank you very much for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Patreon.com slash the Penske file if you want to support the show. Cool. That's Carbon Creek, and we'll be back with, I think, Minefield is the next episode. Minefield. Am I right? Is this one also about 50s Pennsylvania coal towns? No. This is the introduction of the Romulans, so you should be excited Ooh, for that. Okay. They have, uh, much like the Ferengi, they have cannon that they have to work around to make this work. Oh, really? Yep. So... Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. So I can I can look forward to them disappearing at the end of the, <laughs> everybody are, forgetting. Arch will arrest all of them and say, get, "He'll shake his finger at them and say, get out of here.'" Yeah. Cool. That's it. Thank you. Too bad we never learned that species' name. The cannon. Just to who knows? No, uh, no real spoilers. But um, the cannon for this is that if you remember in Balance of Terror, they have never seen a Romulan up until mm-hmm. Balance of Terror. So, right. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for listening. Thank you for supporting the show. We'll be back with Minefield. See you.